original book and um let me get rid of this thing um the uh some of the notes we have in the labs um so yeah chapter seven moving beyond linearity um so most of the models we've seen in the chapters previous make pretty strong parametric assumptions about the data that we're trying to model. Um, and this chapter is about trying to maintain the simplicity and interpretability of the models while gaining a little more flexibility. Um, I found, um, so I, I'll just go through here. There's a couple of highlights I had. Um, but yeah, so the assumption of, of linearity is always, oh, almost always wrong, but it's useful. Um, but there's some trade-offs there. Um, so the, the the variance of the estimates is is a is a problem that we can that we can run into in some cases. Um, but if you can relax the strength of the assumptions, then we can gain some accuracy and maintain interpretability. Um, so there's a couple different methods that they go through here in this chapter. Um, so polynomial regression, where you, you you choose some power and expand up to that. Um, that's like the classic old school way, I guess. Um, step functions is turning a continuous variable into a discrete variable. So you're cutting some continuous range into, into categorical chunks. Um, regression splines. Um, so these are like polynomials. Um, so you're you're fitting polynomials on those uh, those step function chunks, um, but they're constrained so that the join has to be continuous. Um, there's some pretty good visual, visualizations of that later on. Um, Smoothing splines, um, similar to the regression splines, but they're but they're smoothed with some penalty. Um, so that goes back to the lambda argument that we had, I think, last chapter, or maybe the one before. Um, and then local regressions um, are similar to splines, but the regions overlap. So I, I found that these two. That the smoothing slides is is tiled where the 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 regions don't overlap. You're moving one one chunk at a time, whereas the local regression, if they're allowed to overlap, then it's a sliding across some range, and they're and then they're allowed to overlap. Um, and then the generalized out of the models, GAMS, um, this allows us to use those methods and deal with multiple predictors. Um, that seems like um, if you want to do a parametric model but get the maximum flexibility, they, then GAMs are probably the right move there. Um, so we'll, we'll just keep moving on down here. Um, so here we look at the polynomial regression. So we choose some power and expand the formula up to that, so up to up to D there, the so two, three, and then up to D. Um, so it's just multiple linear regression with those added predictors. Um, this is like a classic method, but you can get very strange behavior on the boundary of the X variable. Um, so you want to keep the, the D power um, low because things can get funny. Um, this shows um, some of that. So um, so this shows that at the at the end of the range of age, that polynomial um, creates some very wide um, those confidence intervals are very wide. Um, this is where we're getting a little away from the interpretability of the basic linear model. Um, once you start doing these 
polynomials or splines, uh, the individual coefficients of the of the variables are not um, as helpful. Um, here they they sort of simulate the entire the function against the entire grid of of the variable of the values to try and estimate or try and look at what the impact is instead of looking at coefficients. Um, so they show the two times standard error curves that again, that's, that's the, that, that's the dotted line, upper and lower. Um, so that's how you look at the variance of the fit. Um, so that's 95% interval if you do the two times approximately. Um, let me go back to the notes there and see if they had any. any uh, I like this code a lot better, frankly. I'm a tidy. I'm a tidy verse person, so this code was a lot more readable for me. Um, so here they're using the, the the tidy models package to to create their recipe and they did the step poly. So it takes the continuous input and you specify the degrees. We do any regression. You fit that. We simulate that range with, with sequence and then you add that on to the the what that simulation data with a confidence interval um so this is just recreating that plot from the book but with tiny models um so i found this was this was interesting um when it expands the um the, the, the formula there with those additional powers. Um, it's not just, you know, 18 squared and 18 cubic. They do a orthogonal um, translation, which I think is, is, is similar to principal components. So, so it removes the collinearity between these variables. Um, so it's not just a, a straight, you know, Applying that math, it's the, the do some additional processing there. Um, that function is a yeah, single plot, the tidyverse stuff. Um, you can see that it definitely misses on some of the um, on some of the patterns there. But if you have, if the data is stepped or discretized for some reason. Um, like maybe for insurance purposes, you're trying to model the population and below 18 and over 18 are significant groups that are treated different, differently for, for legal or policy purposes. That might make sense to have a step function that splits it at 18. Um, but in, if, there's, if there's no like outside reason to, 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 to cut that continuous variable into discrete chunks, then step functions, um, they can miss some of the party there. Um, let me go back to the book. Um, so yeah, step functions, so, so the polynomial functions impose a global structure on the data, um, whereas step functions, you, you break it into bins, you put the cut points, um, and there's all sorts of ways to think about how to identify those cut points. Sometimes you just try things. Sometimes there's a data different reason behind it. Um, so this turns the continuous variable into dummy variables, essentially. Um, sometimes in in practical business workflows, um, the business people prefer to see continuous variables broken down into discrete bins. Um, I think that's typically a bad idea, but, but sometimes it helps to communicate. Um, so it's, it's, that's an option. Um, yeah, so unless there's natural breakpoints, then they can miss the action. Um, so these are so the the polynomial and piecewise are are cases of basis functions. Um, so just transformations that can be applied to a variable. 
Um, so we know these ahead of time and we can we make a conscious decision to apply them, right? Um, so regression splines, um, creating separate polynomials over different regions, right? And the, those regions are, are defined by knots, AKA those cut points that we saw in the stepwise section. Um, yeah, so so knots are a way to change the degrees of freedom of the of that variable in the model, um, or I guess in the model itself. So more knots means that the function is more adaptable to the data, uh, which can be good or bad. Um, see what they yeah in seven three yeah so here here they is it seven, yeah so this is a couple of different ways to do um these methods so this is a piecewise cubic obviously a discontinuity there at 50 um so those those lines are not continuous uh, this one does a little bit better but there's still a, like a V or, or U shape there. Cubic spline looks even better. And then linear um, is, I don't know if that's good or bad, but this is different. Um, um, so these all have different um, degrees of freedom, these methods, they, they add, um, varying degrees of freedom to the model. Um, the more constraints you have, the fewer degrees of freedom the model will have. Um, so here in that lower left one here, they added, um, well, so, so the, the, this one has one constraint where the, where the end and beginning there have, have to be continuous and to touch. This one has additional constraints for the second and third derivatives have to also um, be continuous. So the slope and the change in the slope also are continuous. Um, so again, if, so as you um, add constraints, it'll become more, yeah, more smooth, I think that's right. Um, and you're also reducing complexity and reducing the degrees of freedom. Yeah, so this linear spline is just, you divide it by the knot and then fit a line in each region. So here they go into how knots interact with truncated power bases, or the basis. Um, and just this goes into the degrees of freedom for cubic splines. Um, And this this note like this that makes sense to me because the the the, the line looks the most continuous. If you go back up to here, like that looks the most reasonable fit for that for that data as opposed to these discontinuities here. Yeah, okay, move on. Um, okay, so natural splines has one additional boundary um, where, where, the, where the boundary also has to be linear. Um, so here, you can see that they end up basically at the same area at the very end of the data, but the path is much more smooth where it gets very quickly on the cubic spline. spline this natural cubic spline um, is much more smooth at the boundary. Again, the, the conversion intervals are still wide, but they're not as, the, 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 the variance is lower. So 
where to put the knots. Um, there's multiple ways to try it, but in, in, is it they say in practice, you put them in a uniform way, you know, at the 25th and 50th and 75th percentiles of the variable, for example. Um, but if you have some specific reason to think that other locations might, might be better, then you can try those. So here you can see that the, the dashed lines re represent the three knots they have and the natural cubic spline. Um, so it has one, two, three, four segments that it's modeling there. Um, so you can either eyeball it and choose the combination of knots that makes the best looking curve, or you can use cross validation. Um, and we can see that they do some cross validation here and, and uh, the there's diminishing returns on the number of degrees of freedom on these things. So typically you can get the most gain in the first couple um, degrees of freedom and everything after that is uh, probably going to make your model overfit. So comparing the natural spline to polynomial, uh, so the polynomial will, will behave poorly at the boundaries of the continuous variable, whereas the natural cubic spline does pretty well at the boundary. Um, the, the, the spline has fewer degrees of freedom than the polynomial, so that's why it behaves that way. And you can see here, like that, that's a good example of, of how they pretty much are the same in the densest area of the data, um, but they vary a lot on the boundaries. So that, that, that cubic spline there is um, pretty aggressively smooth at the boundaries. So smoothing splines. Um, so we're looking for a, a function G that, that, that smoothly represents the trend in the data or the pattern in the data. Um, you don't want a line that, that interpolates the the data so it just draws a line through every single data point because that's going to over overfit right on a on any data that the model hasn't seen so there's a tuning parameter here um and the function g is a function that um randomizes that parameter so there's a, again we have a loss plus penalty idea here going back to page regression and lasso So yeah, so loss function encourages the, the, the function to fit the data well, and the penalty term penalizes any increase in, in the variance in the function. Um, so it sort of boxes it in to get a function that fits the data and is smooth. So if, if the if the tuning function or the tuning parameter is zero, then um, it'll draw a line through every single data point. And when it approaches infinity, it'll be a straight line. Um, so that's another way to control the, the bias variance trade-off. Let me go back to um, this section here real quick, see if I wanted to pull anything out of here. We saw those graphs. Um, yeah, so in, in for practical programming, in a lot of these, you're actually specified the degrees of freedom, not this term. Um, I guess that's just more straightforward to do. Um, yeah, okay. I 
effective degrees of freedom here just at the end. Um, well, okay, so let's go back here. So, so this is again, like a sh the idea is that there's a penalization and shrinking of the spline, which goes back to Rage or Lasso. Um, pro I guess probably Ridge. Um, yeah, so that that this term here controls the, the, the level at which the spline is shrunk. If you increase the penalty, then the effective degrees of freedom goes down. So you can do this via cross validation. Um, again, uh, just comparing plus lines with varying degrees of freedom. Um, and they say later on, I think that is it. Yeah. So in general, um, the simpler model is preferred unless the data justifies a more complex model. Um, so again, if there's diminishing returns in, in the degrees of freedom you have, then choose the simplest one that, that still gives enough accuracy. Um, so local regression, again, this is the, this is the sliding method where you choose um, some span and it fits a, a line to the, the data around that region and it moves it along in a sliding way. This is the low last function that you see in ggplot, um, genome smooth. Um, so sort of like nearest neighbors. Yeah. So span S is the proportion of the points used to compute the local regression. So that controls the flexibility. Um, so the smaller the span, the, the smaller the, the sliding area is. So it'll look at less data. Um, so it'll be more wrinkly and reactive to local patterns. Whereas if the span is one, It'll look at the entire range of the data and basically for a straight line. Um, so they say this this can perform poor, poorly if you have multiple predictors, um, more than three or four, because there's going to be fewer training observations close to any given point, and that's the kind of cursive dimensionality. The, the more predictors you have, the more ways there are for that observation to be different than others. Uh, so here we're getting into GAMS, um, the general generalized out of the model. Um, so these are extensions of the simple linear regression. So this gives us the ability to, to apply nonlinear functions to our predictors while maintaining the, the additivity of the model itself. So we can, we can calculate a separate function for each predictor and then add all their contributions together. I think this is a typical linear model with, with some function applied to each input. And then this is a GAM, I believe. With 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 the, with the smoothing splines. Yeah. Um, so we you can't use smoothing splines and least squares um, because of backfitting, which is, I, that was a little, I didn't have time to go into that. Um, but the games give you a partial residual, which allows us to look at um, the effect of each variable.
Yeah, so we can automatically model these nonlinear relationships with GAMS. We don't need to, to try out every single possibility or, or possible way to transform the, the inputs. Um, there's potential for upside in terms of accuracy. Um, and because it's additive, we can still look at the effect of each of each input on the target variable while holding those other ones constant. Um, so if we look at degrees of freedom, that's how we summarize the smoothness of each function. Um, so it's still additive. So um, with as many variables p in your data, then the GAM can still miss, miss out on some pattern there, but there's ways to, you can try adding interaction terms um, and things like that to try and increase the flexibility of the model there. Um, so this is a like a midpoint between fully linear and highly parameterized models and fully non-parametric models like um, XGBoost or something like that. Um, this is a, a compromise there where you can still get some interpretability, but it's a more flexible model. Um, and then you can apply these to classification problems as well. Um, so again, we're calculating the log of, of, of that and otherwise it's mostly the same. Um, let me see if there's any other graphs I wanted to go through here. Yeah, I think that was that's it as far as the actual content of the chapters goes. Uh, were there any any questions or comments on this one? Yeah, for my own side, I think I don't have comments. I don't know if. Yeah, no, not, not from my end. Um, yeah, nice job. I thought you explained things very well. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, I think I think we're getting into the the much more complicated side of the book here. But you know, more flexible models means I guess it can be more accuracy if it's not horribly overfit. <laughs>